Dave Thompson owned a steakhouse in West Tennessee that was one of the favorite restaurants of Elvis Presley, the late great Elvis Presley. Now, depending on where you land theologically, he may not be the late great. He may be still around. I don't know what you believe about his resurrection or even his death, but Elvis loved this restaurant, and at the height of his fame, Dave Thompson decided to host at his restaurant to kind of build up some business, uh, decided to host an Elvis impersonation contest that Elvis himself entered into. Uh, the, the restaurant owner was a little worried that things might go a little crazy when Elvis took the stage. And when Elvis got on stage, he sang the famous Love Me Tender and ended and wrapped up the song to a polite applause and a third place trophy <laughs> in an Elvis impersonation contest. They had no clue that it was actually Elvis himself singing Love Me Tender that night. They didn't even recognize greatness right in front of them. And I just wonder for my own life and maybe even for yours, how often we do the same. When God is at work and God is moving and, 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 and doing things that are only explainable by God at work, how often we miss it. We were just in Tennessee and woke up every morning in this remote cabin in East Tennessee, just outside of the Smoky Mountains. And there were flocks and herds, or whatever you call it, of deer that went across the valley, and, and turkey that would walk across, and, and bear every morning, albeit one less bear now after I went through, but one... <laughs> One morning, we were just sitting, enjoying coffee and loving the scenery and just reminded of how great God is. And yet, we live in one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth here in Southern California. I just wonder how often we miss God on the move and God working when his greatness and his glory is right in front of us every single day. We are in this uh, new series that we're calling Who Can Be Against Us from this legendary passage in the book of Romans where Paul says there is therefore now, right now, for you and I in Christ, there is now, not, not some future date, not it was when Jesus was around, but there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Courtney kicked off this series last week reminding us that we are, as children of God, we are loved by God himself, which has implications for our life, which means for us today that we can never underestimate what God can do, even in, especially in our shortcomings, because God seems to specialize in using inadequate resources. When God called you, God already factored in all of your shortcomings, just like he did with me. God wants to work in you, and God wants to work through you, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you've left undone, or what's been done to you. What does this mean for us? It means that while your pain may explain you, it does not define you. Your successes, those achievements, those accomplishments in your life, the things that you're proud of, the things that you've done and accomplished professionally, personally, while those successes may explain you, they don't define you. Is anybody with me today, church? God's grace is greater than your past. God's grace is greater than whatever you're going through right now today. God's grace is going to be greater for you and better than anything that you're going to walk through in the future. Because God's power is bigger than your performance. How do I know that? Because I've read the pages of scripture that tell of the failures and the shortcomings and the brokenness of people there. Look at the story of David. David blew it. Rahab was a prostitute in the Old Testament and yet in the lineage of the Savior of the world in the New Testament. The woman at the well was a total wreck when she ran into Jesus. This is the gospel. One of the major distinctions between Christianity and every other world religion that has ever existed in history is that every other religion teaches that you got to fight for righteousness. If we just fight hard enough, if we put our back into it, if we row hard enough in the opposite direction of what's wrong and toward everything that is right, then, then we can be accepted by God. But Christianity, 
on the other hand, the whole entirety of Scripture, the life and the ministry and the teaching and the work of Jesus, all says no. The fight has already been won. We can be accepted by God. Not because of us, but because of God. Following Jesus is all about his work, not ours. Now, if this is news to you this morning, I I hope it's good news. If this is just a a repeat of something you've heard, you heard this and you're thinking, well, yeah, Brandon, well, that's the basics. Get on with it. Why, Why am I even talking about this? The reason I'm talking about this today is because so many people have grown up in church and yet not grown more like Jesus, which is an issue which causes tension, which is just a miss for everything that God wants for us in our life. And we need this reminder, as simple and as foundational as it may feel and as it may seem, we need this reminder today, which is why Paul wrote Romans chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles, let's let's dive in. Y'all ready to do some work in the Word this morning? In Romans chapter 8, we've we were told last week, and we can be reminded this week, that Romans was written by a guy named Paul, a guy who became a follower of Jesus after spending his entire life fighting hard to be good enough, fighting hard to follow all of the rules. And Paul came to this point of realizing that he's really good at following the rules, but following the rules isn't following Jesus, and only one of those matters. So Paul wrote this letter to a group of Christians in the Roman Empire. The story checks out. Book of Romans written to people in the Roman Empire. See what he did there. I'm dropping dimes on you this morning. Just wait. Buckle up. It's going to get great. But in Rome, it wasn't easy to follow Jesus. Because every other voice said, follow me. Every other voice said, follow this. Try that. Follow this person instead of Jesus, which is what led Paul to write this in Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For those who, who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Paul boils this down and takes all of these voices, takes all of these struggles, takes all of these cultural influences, and uses the word flesh. It's just a metaphor for sin. In the ancient Greek and Roman culture, for culture, philosophers used this term flesh for any life that was disconnected from God. Anything that was disconnected from God was known as sin. But if we're talking practically this morning, here, here's what Paul is, is reminding us. Here's what he's showing us. He's, he's showing us practically this. What we listen to determines what we long for. What we listen to in our life, the voices that we choose to take in and consume, shapes and determines what we long for. Said another way, what we focus on shapes what we move toward. What we're focused on in our life is eventually what we're going to move toward. When our kids were first starting to walk, Uh, literally, they'd be all over the place, you know, bumbling and fumbling around. But all we would need to do is just take them by the top crown of their little head and just move them in the direction that we wanted them to go. And sure enough, where their eyes were pointing, their feet would walk. That's what Paul is saying to us this morning. Uh, John Mark Comer, author and pastor, says it this way, what you give your attention to is the person you become. Put another way, the mind is a portal to the soul, and what you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you gave your attention to. That bodes well for those apprentices of Jesus, who give the bulk of their attention to him and all that is good, beautiful, and true in the world. This has implications for our life. Because what we long for has a profound impact on our life. Can I go further? What we long for may be the greatest predictor of how our lives will turn out. The the advertising industry knows all about this. They know that if they can get you to listen long enough, you might start start to think you actually need it. I've experienced this. Maybe you've experienced it too where you can't sleep at night and you just throw the news on and the news cycle at night plays the same commercials back to back over and over and over and over again to the point that it's just completely and utterly annoying. 
But then by about the fourth or fifth time, I'm watching the news and there's this commercial that keeps playing back to back and I can almost repeat it time and time again. And by the fourth or fifth time, I'm like, maybe I need a jar of Flex Seal. I don't know what I would need it for, but maybe I need it. Maybe, maybe as a dad, if our kids get injured, just slap some Flex Seal on that and it'll heal a multitude of sins and injuries. I, I, I don't know. But here's why this is so important. It's important because we're all listening to something. We're all listening to someone. We are, as John Mark Comer says in his book, Practicing the Way, we're all being formed already. We're all becoming someone. We're all becoming something already. The question is, who are we becoming? It's why Paul says in Romans 8, verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Paul is telling us as followers of Jesus, we have been reformed. We've been reshaped to think differently. We've been reformed in ways that, that shape our longings, that shape our desires, our, our thoughts, our responses, our reactions. And here's why it's important. Paul goes on in verse 6, for, the, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Where our mind goes, there our life goes. It's just like Elvis. We miss the real thing when our focus is set on the false thing. When all we focus on is our career and our profession and getting to the next position so that we can have more power or more authority, we miss the real thing right in front of us. When all we're focused on is our, our stuff and how much we can collect and how much we can get and the next brightest, best thing, when, when our focus is even on good things like our kids, we get all wrapped around the axle thinking, I want my kids to accomplish things that I never could accomplish, and so we begin to live vicariously through our kids, and Paul is saying instead, we ought to be, we have to be. There's life and death hanging in the balance. We've got to be focused on the spirit. This is a term that maybe you've heard in church, spirit-led. This is what Paul is talking about, be spirit-led. But oftentimes in church, when this comes up in conversation, it's this often ambiguous idea that sometimes church people use to insinuate that we're just super spiritual people. We use super spiritual big words that uh, sometimes people just don't even understand because if you don't understand what spiritualese and Christianese we're using, then we can't really question what you're talking about, and then it just makes you seem super spiritual. And so that's kind of what happens when we think about someone being spirit, uh, spirit-led, where, where we just exude super, super spiritual lives and just randomly break into Chris Tomlin songs whenever things go sideways as if our life is a musical. But Paul is setting this standard He's setting the stage that spirit-led leads to life and peace, which is what we're all looking for, right? We want the good life. We want a life of peace. The problem is we just look in all of the places other than the spirit of God for peace in our life. We look to relationships. You've ever gotten into a relationship that you knew wasn't a good relationship, but you just, you just stayed too long. Because you were lonely or because you were desperate or just because you wanted to be with someone and so you stayed in this relationship that you knew was wrong. We do it all the time. Have you ever bought anything? We do this with purchases. Have you ever bought anything that you didn't really need that was a total waste of money? We do this all the time. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. And Paul is reminding us that what we listen to shapes our longings. And if you listen to anything other than Jesus too long, then it just leads to death. What could go wrong? It's just stuff. It's just a relationship. What could go wrong? It's just a job. What could go wrong? It's just a kid. Paul says life and death is in the balance here. He goes on in verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is kind of our natural bend, isn't it? 
kind of our natural tendency. We, we want to do life on our own terms. But sin isn't just something that we do that we can kind of meddle with and play with and then pack up our toys and go somewhere else. No, sin isn't something that we just do. It's a power that gets a hold of us in our life. Sin reshapes our life so much so that our life can get so out of control and so sideways because of it. So Paul goes on, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. As followers of Jesus, you're not in the flesh. You are filled with spirit-led people who've been changed. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who doesn't have the spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. You want to know how you know if you're spirit-led? You want to know how you know if your life is being defined by the spirit of God at work within you? You probably know those people who like, it just seems like everything is going just fine for them. They're just crushing it in life. They just have figured it out. They've got it going for them spiritually. And, and, and you and I are over here, we're just running on empty. Like, they're so nice and so kind. They're so holy and good. And we're over here waking up on the wrong side of the bed, snapping at our family before we've even brushed our teeth. We get stuck in traffic. We get frustrated with crazy drivers who drive in the left lane on their, on their cell phone texting when we're trying to get somewhere. We're over here struggling, and others just seem to have it all figured out. Have you, have you ever noticed that? Am I the only one? I could be. This is the moment where you say, yes, pastor, we're with you. You don't know what we call that? Normal. Normal. Listen, don't ever judge your spiritual life by what you don't know about somebody else's spiritual life. Good marker for you there. Leads to dissatisfaction, disgruntled, depressing lifestyle. Don't ever judge your spiritual life by what you don't know about somebody else's spiritual life. Let me just tell you this. Christianity is not about cross necklaces, spiritual sayings that you turn into tattoos all over your body. Christianity is not about spiritual social media posts. It's not, Christianity is not about aligning with some political party. Following Jesus is about seeking the heart of God. Paul says it's about dying to your flesh and being a misfit in a culture of chaos. Christianity, as Genesis said earlier, isn't all cute and cuddly. It's hard. But we're Christian, not by the title that we take, but by the way that we live. It's how well we tip the exhausted waitress who's just trying to do her best. It's about how well we treat the stranger who bumps into us on accidents. It's it's about how patient and how kind we are when we haven't gotten much sleep and when we're grumpy. It's, It's about how civil we are to someone who disagrees with us. It's the little things where we see how big of a difference Jesus has made in our life. That's what Paul's talking about here. Uh, Paul's reminding us in this moment that there are no super spiritual Christians that have some super spiritual powers that some of us just didn't get. No, everyone, Paul says, who is in Christ has his spirit. Just like there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, the spirit of God is in us who are in Christ. Verse 10, Paul says, "But but if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Our physical bodies are dying. I hope that's not surprising to anyone, but you're going to die. But God is in the business of reversing death. Paul goes on, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Paul says almost the exact same thing. Did you catch it? He says uh, almost the exact same thing twice. He says that the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, and then a couple of words later, he says, he who raised Jesus from the dead. Why the repetition? Uh, We gotta remember some context and some culture here in this moment because paper 
that the Bible was written on, the paper that Paul wrote this book of Romans on was so precious. Paper wasn't a common thing. Like you couldn't just go down to Staples, pick up a ream of paper and jam it into your HP printer that's gonna run out of ink the first three pages you try to print. It's not that easy. Okay, paper was pounded from reeds. It was expensive. It was time consuming. There was a process to this that meant paper was valuable. So valuable that in the ancient Greek manuscripts that the books of the Bible were written on, they didn't even put spaces in between the words. They all just ran together because space was so valuable and paper was so hard to come by. So why on earth would Paul repeat himself almost word for word in this moment because he's doubling down on the power and the promise of resurrection? He's bringing our attention squarely into focus on the promise of the power of resurrection that our earthly bodies will be raised back to life just like Jesus. And they will be different than the ones that we're in now. No more knee pain. No more back pain from just sleeping a good night's sleep. No more foggy eyesight. No more, no more cancer. No more unexplainable diseases from a diagnosis you weren't expecting. God is bringing all things back to life. And so there will come a day when our earthly bodies will be here no more. We'll be under that, we'll no longer be under that guise of cancer. No, no longer arthritis, no longer tears in meniscus and all of that. Because God is making all things new. About 600 years before Paul wrote this, God gave a man, a, a prophet named Ezekiel, a picture of a day coming in Ezekiel 37. We sang about it. But in Ezekiel 37, we can see this story that inspired the song Rattle. And the story goes in Ezekiel 37 that the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley that was full of bones. And he led me among them and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley and behold, they were very dry. Do you catch the scene here? Put yourself in this moment. God has taken Ezekiel and put him in this valley uh, uh, that is littered and scattered with dry bones. Everywhere. Uh, bones that are so dry because they've been dead for so long. Verse 3, and God said to Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel answered, oh Lord God, only you know. Which is basically code for, uh, God, I don't see how, but I don't want to say you can't really do it because you're God and all. The story goes, then God said to Ezekiel, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and, you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So Ezekiel prophesied and as he was commanded, and as he prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. Can you hear it? Some bones clanking together. As Ezekiel prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone, and I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain so that they may live. And so Ezekiel prophesied that God had commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Incredible. This is what God does. He brings life. The song that we sang says, resurrection power runs in my veins too. What on earth does that even mean? Paul reminds us, Ezekiel reminds us that the same power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus up from the grave back into life is the same power that lives in us. And while we won't see the resurrection of our bodies until Jesus comes back, make no mistake that today, Jesus is bringing new life to dry bones today. 
He's bringing new life to the dry bones of our relationships that have been dead and dry from unforgiveness and bitterness and selfishness. God is breathing new life into the dry bones that have been dried out for years from us listening to that voice of sin that promised pleasure and has only provided pain. God is breathing new life into the dry bones of our souls that have been dried out from religion and he's offering a fresh wind and a new life and a power from his spirit. That's the beauty of the gift of God's grace. It doesn't matter how far gone you feel. It doesn't matter how, how dead and gone you feel like you are, how dry the bones are. Resurrection power runs in my veins and your veins too. And I believe there's another miracle here in this room. See, the result of a life trusting Jesus, listening to the spirit in our life is God reverses what was dead and dying and stolen and abandoned and abused. The spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to our earthly bodies. But even now, he's bringing new life to our dry bones. Uh, our family had a family reunion when I was uh, in high school and uh, our, our family reunion happens in London. It's just how we roll. London, <laughs> London, Kentucky. And everybody had gotten to the reunion, and we were all playing cornhole and horseshoes, because that's what rednecks do. And we realized we didn't have any hamburger buns for all of the hamburgers that we were serving our whole family. And so as the youngest, uh, as the youngest family member of driving age, I was voluntold to go and get hamburger buns. And so I go to get into our family's minivan and the minivan's blocked in because in my family, on time is 15 minutes early. We're the only ones who are on time. And so our minivan's blocked in and so my uncle tosses me the keys to his 1972 forest green Chevrolet Corvette, 5.7 liter V8. I'm 16 years old. And my brother whispers in my ear, remember that this car is more valuable than your life. <laughs> if you scratch this car, you will lose your life. And so I get in the car and I head to Piggly Wiggly, which is a grocery store. This is a real, it's really a grocery store. And I'm on my way to Piggly Wiggly and I'm driving this 1972 Corvette. And I'm going between like 25 and 45 miles an hour. I'm just kind of cruising down the road and getting good gas mileage and get the hamburger buns. I get back into this Corvette convertible and I'm just in, enjoying a zero traffic cruise through London, Kentucky in my dream car and I pull up to the one traffic light in the entire city and there's nobody around and I had a thought, <laughs> which is dangerous. I thought, I, I wonder if this car has any power and so I kick it into first gear because your pastor can drive a stick shift. I throw it in first gear, I rev it up a little bit, and I just grip it and rip it. This car already had so much power, but my uncle had souped up the engine to where it was a 600 horsepower upgrade with a zero to 60 of less than three seconds and a zero to 100 in less than five seconds. Hypothetically, just in case he's listening. Zero to 100 in less than five seconds. This thing had more power than I've ever experienced in my life. And yet there I was just kind of cruising around town as if I was driving a minivan. Isn't that kind of how we live our life? With the spirit of God inside us. We, we go through life living on our own, just cruising around with the top down, never realizing the power at work within us. There's so many places in our life that feels like dry bones to the point that we believe it's actually impossible to hope. It's impossible that we'll experience happiness or, or health, but God has a message for us today. And the message is this, there can be new life in your relationships. There can be new life in your finances. There can be a fresh breath of the spirit of God moving in your marriage, in your parenting, in your friendships, in your career. And the more we learn to listen to the Spirit, 
The more we tune in to what God wants for our life, the more we spend time in the word, the more that we seek to hear from God in prayer, the more that we can experience the life that is coming right now. Because resurrection power runs in my veins too. And we can experience his resurrection power in every area of our life where there are dry bones. I know that there are so many people in this room today and watching online who need this truth in your life, in your relationships. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you just need a fresh breath from the Spirit of God today. And what I want us to do this morning is I just want us to open up this space all, all along the wings, maybe even here at the altar. And maybe you're just in need of prayer today. We've got staff, we've got some overseers who are here today who I just ask if you would make your way to the wings, make your way to the front so that so we can spend time praying over each other. Listen, when, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. Maybe, maybe there's just someone that you know who's carrying a burden and you just need to walk across the room and you need to put your arm around them and just pray with them. Maybe there's someone that you need to remind today that the dry bones in their life can be resurrected today. Maybe this is just a moment for your family to, to huddle up and pray that God would fill your family afresh and new with his spirit. All across this room today, would you join me in asking God, would you bring life to what's dead in our life? Let's pray. God, we are, we're encouraged in moments that can sometimes feel discouraging, where we feel like all hope is gone, where we feel like there's no help in sight. God, would you breathe life through your spirit over your church today. God, to the relationships that are dead, to the relationships that are dying, to the relationships that the flame is, is fizzling out, to the relationships that have never caught flame, God, would you breathe life and hope today. In our finances, God, would you provide and in ways that can't be explained other than your resurrection power running through our veins. God, would you work in such unexplainable ways today that we are convinced with great confidence that you and your spirit are alive and well within us. We pray this confidently in the name of Jesus. Amen.